Our guest in the first segment, Martinsburg City Councilman Jason Baker. JB, good morning, man. Good morning. How are you? Great, man. Thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me. You brought a lot of papers. I did. A lot of numbers on those papers. There is. Yeah, let's let's get into that a little bit too, right? Okay. So let's talk about the Martinsburg budget process. Mr. Gilstrip asked you off there, how much uh, in regards to revenue is the city of Martinsburg have flowing through on an annual basis? And the number was surprising to him. Um, roughly. Right, come a little closer to your mic too. With everything there, we'd be close to about $30 million. What are the different sources of revenue coming in? You would have uh, B&O, you would have our 1% sales tax, um, we, you, uh, water, sewer, trash. Even severance taxes. It's called severance tax, which is what our meetings mostly about, outside agency request that we'll be talking about tonight in our uh, um, committee meeting. How much coal severance does Martinsburg City get? Well, I, had, I uh, sent a text to get an exact number because um, it wasn't clo- it wasn't on the exact number on there. But roughly forty to fifty thousand is our normal allotment from the state coal severance tax. Has that gone up since the price of uh, gas is in, uh, and coal it, have gone up? It's fluctuated, but not enough for the uh, amount of requests that my folder down here mm-hmm. has has went up. Show that folder size. That's, these are the requests for the money? Yeah, this, is just, this isn't this is for anything with the city. This is all outside agency requests. Agencies looking for some funding from the city. Yes. Continue. And, and good stuff. I mean, we're not... You're, it's the stuff that we don't even think about. It's the... Um, the Pantran, it's Boys and Girls Club, it's Parks and Recs, it's um, you know the Airport Authority, Region Nine, um, the uh, Martinsburg Initiative, um, Apollo Theater, it's it the Health Department. There's a mm-hmm. lot of that stuff. And now some of those things were required by state to match. You know, like on the Airport Authority, we have three members, so we were required to have five thousand dollars per member. If we have a member on the airport authority, the health department, you know, it's similar because obviously our people are using that Mm -hmm. services. I'm going to guess if you fulfill every wish, you will spend much more money than you actually have to spend. Well, we're already to that point. Yeah. So So, what's the process? I mean, it's hard to say no. So is it to say a little bit of yes to everybody or how does that work? We we try to get no one has complete. Um. A lot of times with our request, it's the people that are closest to us that really have the most input into the, our peop, our citizens. You know, Boys and Girls Club, um, Parks and Rec. These are these are entities that all, almost every city resident is going to have an effect with. Um, meals on Wheels. You know, our seniors getting meals. Um, but you are correct. It's it's tough. <laughs> you know, and, and and we're we always are debating where it is. A lot of times we can't fulfill the the full request, and and you go through. We ask them for their financials. You know that plays a, a fact. If you're asking us for fifty thousand, and you have one point five million dollars in your bank account, and that's not hypothetical. That's an actual request with someone that has one point five million dollars in their bank. Gilstra, I thought you were looking right at Gilstrap saying he's got a million and a half in his bank. So, account. John, what do you need the five grand for exactly? <laughs> you know, you know that's going to be looked a little bit differently un- compared to Mills on Wheels, who pretty much every dollar that they get sure. is going right back out the door. Do the leaders of these organizations come in and pitch their case face to face? They do, which makes it one degree even more difficult. Some of them, some of them do better than others, um, but it. They'll come and they'll talk, and and in a lot of these, you know, Parks and Recs, for example, it, their request is is a significant amount of money. Um, you know, it's it's roughly a half a million dollars, um, but some of that's already funded through uh, the hotel motel. You know, that's already the two percent. My first term, it was one thing I did to get them up to the two percent. That the council decided we moved everything to their their full. Um, percentage that they could have. How, how does that money flow from a procedure standpoint from the hotel motel tax, Jason? It would come through the tax through the hotels um, through us, and then it gets split between the visitor bureau. And do, the, do the hotels pay that tax directly to the city, or does it go to the state and then it gets redistributed? The state. Okay. Is there a, is there a state cap on how much we can charge in hotel motel tax? Yes. That's terrible. 
No, I mean seriously, <laughs> for for an area like ours, it's a very. I mean, we get we get a lot of tourism. I mean, why not add a point or two to that? Michael Height, Mike Hornby. What do you guys think about that? I think that's a. I think it's a valid point that a local jurisdiction should be able to, because I mean, you're basically we're we're trying to. Other states get a lot of money in taxes, a lot of money in tolls, a lot of money in everything from our from our West Virginians. It would be nice if we could add a point or two to the the hotel motel tax to do and more. And especially because, as opposed to like a sales tax, where even locals have to pay sales tax, locals aren't staying in motels and hotels. It's well, all from the outsiders. Most of them aren't. Well, most of them. There's uh, you never know. There, there are those who have issues, but you know. That's, <laughs> I'll, I'll push off on that just a little bit. Our hotel motel is doing very well. Actually, what we want is more hotels. Our hotels are packed. At a percentage, um, a great point. That is way more than the national average, and what these hotels want, because hotels have a certain percentage that they want. They don't want to be booked at a hundred percent, because if you're going down and you always stay at a Holiday Inn, and you're going down the road, and you stop in Martinsburg at that Holiday Inn and it's booked, they've lost you. And now maybe Marriott catches you. So they want, they don't want to be 100% booked. We have actually the issue in Berkeley County is we don't have enough hotels. That's correct. Hey, so does that apply to every hotel and motel? Yes. In- including like Gilstrap's hour by hour rental ho- motel? <laughs> kind of thing? Hey, if, hey. If, they're, if they're going by uh, all the requirements, yes. Okay, that's how he got that million and a half in the bank account kind of thing. You know, a few of those might go weekly. And the five grand was for new signage. (laughs) (laughs) It's always that second letter in the neon sign that's burned out. Always, for some reason. I don't know why. So, And then, then of course, then we got the other projects that are important. Um, And I've spoke about it. There was a little bit of heat about Woodbury Avenue. Mm -hmm. Um, I have update. Would love to share. Yeah, it. please, and, and, um, and remember to stay closer to your microphone. Yes, so I'm sorry. Yeah, it's cool. So uh, Woodbury Avenue, we actually got a draft by uh, CEC mm-hmm. for the engineering and from our traffic. Uh, Woodbury Avenue has roughly ten thousand cars, which is what I a day a day that I roughly estimated myself. Wow, um, they're equally going eastbound and westbound. We have an average, there was, the high speed during the traffic was 55 miles an hour. What's the speed limit on that road? 25, it's a city street. Um, and somewhere in the 30s ended up being average. So we took grandma going 10 and <laughs> fit in, a, in, a, in a speeder at 55 and somewhere in the 30s is where we came out. Hey, I don't, I don't know about that characterization. On 81 today, <laughs> on the way here, I got passed by a woman who was, I mean, she had to be in her 70s, and she was going 80, 90. The little was, old lady from Pasadena. Yes, right? yes. Looking through the windshield, or the uh, steering wheel, the, the yeah. arc of the steering wheel. Looked like she was sitting on a phone book. I mean, it was uh-huh. just uh, stereotypical. Well, well, maybe you were maybe you were the one that came through Woodbury going five that kind of threw off the uh, average there on me a little yeah, bit. That'll, that'll never happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so so we I met with CEC the city's met with them um, and we're in the, they're going back they gave us a big pamphlet of different things that we could do as far as make it a one way um, really restricting the traffic um, there was it was 20 30 pages of what we could do um, so they are coming back with a calming mechanism which is what my recommendation and what hopefully the council will eventually approve is to put a bike lane on Woodbury Avenue Um, because one of the issues with Woodbury Avenue is that in most of the area it's too wide Um, it's almost 30 foot wide in so that's what a bicyclist in there well (laughs) what you do is you actually raise put a sidewalk in okay you act you put a delimiters like you see on the interstate mm-hmm. to separate the bike lane and you start moving traffic over the other thing that i recommended and we'll see if it gets all the way through is um possible raised crosswalks at um two different locations one at high street and one down probably near oliver um, which will allow people to go from the south of woodbury avenue and come north to get onto the bike lane. Um, Do you know what the cost of this could be? It could be anywhere from two to three million dollars. 
it's there when we get into road construction we could have stormwater um sidewalk i i do want a sidewalk put in there there's considerable amount of people that are walking they stay off of woodbury avenue because of the 55 mile an hour 10,000 cars a day and it it is becoming um well in the last week we've had two nasty accidents and uh I would never wish this, but one of the problems that came and when I started bringing up Woodbury Avenue significantly about two years ago, the problem with Woodbury is there wasn't a lot of accidents on it. We had all this traffic, but proportionately it didn't have the accidents, which a lot of people, that's why they kept on pushing me back about doing anything on Woodbury, because do we actually need this? Um, I finally got it through and we got it, you know, engineering is working on it. And now all of us, we are having accidents. Well, it's difficult. Like when you're going to the rec center, you come up High Street and you go to make that right on the Woodbury, and you can sit there. You can sit there for a while, and there are cars going fast. And and the biggest thing, and in our study, that was the thing that we noticed. Um, out of those 10,000 cars, roughly, roughly 9,000 of those cars are going through. So, um, As opposed to? They're Wait, cutting, cutting across town, basically. Yeah, they're not oh, okay. stopping like okay. it's it's a city. the wreck right. center. That, see, that's the thing that a lot of people don't realize, and I know that you do because we've talked about it. Woodbury Avenue is just a city street. Mm-hmm. It's no different than your little neighborhood street that if you live on Delaware Avenue or Alabama or, or wherever else, it's just a city street. It is not designed. It wasn't built. It's not maintained by the state for their traffic that is going – through as a bypass basically that's what woodbury has became yep and that's a shame because it's falling on the taxpayers of the city of martinsburg let me ask you this jason if if this is well known that you're talking about a 55 mile an hour cruising speed is typical uh, this many cars Well, that was the high speed that was the high right okay so let's say 40 which is still 15 miles an hour and over the city speed limit why not have a police car sit there and just write tickets all day long every day until people figure out if i speed on this road i'm going to end up having to pay a couple hundred bucks well and you solve a budgeting problem too in the same day i think there's a couple things so me or you if we're going through martinsburg and we're just going from one point to another point but we're really not going through we're not going to use our gps most people now use their gps mm-hmm so we have done that. I've requested it. Um, the chief was more than accommodating, putting it out there. He wasn't getting the speeds that the report shows that are here. My theory is, is those 9,000 cars, even if they're going to where they know, they're hooking their phone up to their car, mm-hmm. and on their screen has the GPS automatically come up. Well, what GPS does is it also tells me where the cops are. Yes. Because people will, there's a police officer. I believe that that is why we can never catch the real speeders there because if that many cars are coming through, only one person needs to see the cop. Mm -hmm. And once that person, they're going to slow the traffic. As soon as that cop leaves, we're right back to the same issue. Well, the solution there is just to park an empty car there. We did that. We did that for almost six months. And? It didn't. It slowed the traffic, but it also didn't reduce the amount of traffic coming through a city street. See, we're fighting this from from many different angles. The, what is the root problem on that street? Is it why is the sheer volume? If if we can regulate the speed, why is the sheer volume of traffic an issue? Would you want ten thousand cars to go by your house every day? Well, no. Only if I could put a only if I could put a sign for my business back there, I, <laughs> I'd be perfectly happy. And you can. I mean, and I, would, I would try to be smart about, but that's I think that's the thing that people that don't live in that neighborhood that don't realize it is a city street could you imagine i mean could you imagine delaware avenue or alabama having ten thousand cars well when you put the rec center there though you're going to have more traffic than a typical city street would have anyway and it's the easiest way to 45 but i've already told you that out of those ten thousand cars nine thousand of them are going through right they're not stopping at the rec center 
But they know where it is. I mean, maybe they discovered the shortcut because of the rec center. I mean, maybe there should be a lemonade stand, and then our and then our cold severance would do better because we'd have some you get money. Lemonade severance, yes, but I like that. R- realistically, it's it's a bypass that the state has no, has never helped, never funded, never made it correct. The, that traffic is designed to be on forty five. So what do you want to do about it? Calm it, which will slow the traffic, which will help with the GPS knowing that that's a slower route than going up to the stoplight and going to the proper um could you could you calm it by putting a stop sign at every corner so the answer is yes but Woodbury's also has its issue and and what Woodbury's issue is is it doesn't have the traditional block cross streets all of those streets, if you're thinking, I see your, I see you're thinking yeah. right there. Yeah, I'm just thinking about, yeah, the ones. They're, they're offset. They're, they're right? all offset. Yeah, they're all offset, yeah. And so that traditional stop sign at John and Kentucky or or whatever. But just throwing the stop signs in, even if it's not a traditional, even if it's just like high street that's it's one side, I mean, it will stop the the north-south traffic on Woodbury going to 45. Yeah, I never thought about that, man, because I drive that route all the time. I, I coach up at the rec center and have for years. And yeah, yeah, that road is that is a busy road. It it feels like forty five. Well, you're right. And I I was doing work on the road re- recently, not on the road, but a house on the road. Um, and I was getting out of my truck. I got hit by a car. I mean, that's just I'm just one. It, it, talking to some of the constituents in, on that street. Yeah, they don't that have been there for years. They've stopped parking on the street. Woodbury Avenue has parking on both sides of it. No one parks there because over the years, 10,000 cars, you know, that's half. I think in the early 90s, 81 had, I think it was 20,000 cars. Woodbury Avenue is getting half of what 81 got in the 90s. That's. Let me ask you a non-Woodbury Avenue question. All right. Uh, Bob Williams, uh, Parks and Rec, uh, put out a new master plan with uh, parks development and such around the county in and of itself. Uh, in regards to that one, have you seen it and, and, and its effect on the city of Martinsburg, specifically your district? Um, the biggest thing on, on ours is some redevelopment at the um, 2000 Rec Center. Mm-hmm. Um, there's been, I've talked with uh, their president a few times about some of the plans of the expansion of 2000 rec center we uh the pickleball court over there um hundred thousand dollars some of the continue there um we, of course last meeting we've uh we named our uh park on uh burke street so would you name it um east burke street east, park okay Inve- Which, very inventive because David Anderson's got a question about that park in the comment section. He does. It, me and him <laughs> talked actually after the meeting. Mm-hmm. David's a friend. Mm-hmm. He knows where I stand. I, I don't like naming anything after people. Because? I just think in the world that we live in that it's just better to name it, especially a very pocket park, to name it geographically location then name it after an individual, even if that individual has lived hundreds of years ago. Because we might find one detail of their lives that somebody objects to and have to change the name. Well, <laughs> yes. the statue I, down. well have, you ever, have you ever found, one, is there one person that has ever lived on this earth that everybody can agree is perfect? Jesus. Well, I, I, even, I, even my friends in the Jewish community don't agree on that, though, I'm sure. Well, I, I don't think 9-11 would have happened if that was true. Uh, well, there you go. I mean, right? I, so, so that's my stance. I'm not a big naming rights mm-hmm. person. Um, I don't think it's really that important. What, what about if we find out the guy that, that Burke Street in that Burke area was named after did some sort of horrible things? What do we do then? Because you're, I mean, that technically is named after a person. Well, you know, the guy that masterminded that Lufthansa heist, Jimmy the Gent Burke. There's a, oh, a Burke. Jimmy the Gent. That's perfect. That could be tied in with this somehow. Hey, I got, I got a question. Okay. Something that popped up in my head. What is, I mean, do we have a budget deficit or a budget surplus here in the city? So the city will always have a surplus because of how we do our budget. We, we push off until we have our revenue. So kind of like what you would do at your own house. We don't do it. We don't run in a deficit like the feds or, any, you know. So 
we always have a surplus and then w w what we have is how we pay our unfunded balance um, when it comes up and normally we, we try to split it up a little bit because the number started getting a little bit higher once we had our one percent sales tax and so now we push that out a little bit more um, so that's a much harder question than so the answer is yes. City has always had an un, had a, 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 a surplus. How do you feel about the rolling back of the B and O tax with the uh, with the sales tax? And what what do you see that what what implications do you see on the city budget of that? Um, well, we already did that when we put the one percent sales tax in. We we spotted some um, B and O reductions. Um, I think everybody agrees with a B and O is not a great way of taxing the problem is is it's still the biggest source of revenue that city had the cities have in general and then one of the best ways that the state gives you to generate what revenue yeah and, it, it, and until they until everybody figures out a way to make us whole like truly whole the one percent doesn't isn't going to make us whole you know you can't just say we've got one percent and then it's in there. Realistically, it's probably more like a 4% sales tax to make us whole. Yeah, you, you pull in what about, uh, if I remember, somewhere around nine, ten million on the B&O and about four or five on the sales tax? Yeah. yeah. Is that sales tax number leveled off over the last couple of years or does it continue to grow? It seems to keep, continue to grow. And of course, with the price of goods going up and inflation, you're going to pay more tax based on the inflation rate. So, but so, the, so that number is going to grow, but I don't know in inflation numbers if it truly is growing in the value of the dollar. Right. Uh, and we're just about out of time, Jason. So uh, anything you think our audience needs to know, City of Martinsburg residents, that we have uncovered today, anything important coming up? Uh, we have a meeting tonight. And, what time? Uh, uh, 5 o'clock at the uh, police station. Otherwise? Everything's going well. Cool. Hey, thanks for coming in, man. Thank you. Thanks Always good to me. visit with you. Thank you.